Hello, this is Ed Buendia. I'm a professor in the Department of Education, Culture, and Society, and this is Module 3, titled Racism, Otherisms, Intersectionality, and School Structures. And in this module, what we want to uh, walk away with is a clear understanding of the institutionalization of difference. And part of this is going to be a, a bit of a rehash of what you've had in your Ethnic Studies course, particularly understanding the construction of difference along the axes of race as well as uh, gender. So if you've had an ethnic studies class as well as a gender studies class or a gender studies class, a lot of this is going to be familiar to you. But we need to connect this piece to the dimension of educational institutions. So gender, race, and the creation of sexism and racism are going to be the core of the conversation here. And as I mentioned, part of this is going to be familiar to you. But this will hopefully be a opportunity for you to review some of these pieces as we begin to move closely into educational spaces. We also want to understand the macro and microstructural inequality relations and, and understand how those come together to structure these differences. And what we mean by structural are those domains in society, such as residential patternings, the patternings of economic distribution, as well as the way that people find themselves in the labor market. All of these have a particular patterning which are those structural relationships. And so we want to understand the micro as well as the macro dimensions and how they come to impact. We also want to understand school structures as part of these sets of relations. And you want to make sure that you walk away with a clear sense of how the relationship between schools as well as society are in this kind of entangled set of relationships. So you should be clear on how these work and how individuals get plugged into these different relationships as well as how these different societal relationships interface with uh, the domains of schooling. Let's now move into understanding race and gender. Specifically, we want to understand the various isms that are constructed as part of the social reconstruction process. As a beginning point, let's begin with an, uh, just a re-summarizing of race and gender as social constructs. In your ethnic studies courses or gender studies courses, you've had a robust conversation in all probability uh, trying to understand how race and social gender is socially constructed. So that conversation, if you recall, is talked about the way that race and gender are produced in one sense through different kinds of discourses. Or what we mean by discourses are somewhat of those cultural apparatuses that help to uh, give us a framework and insert a language for thinking about these different constructs. And if equally, we've also had conversations of the social structure, uh, social, social reproduction of uh, race and gender. So they are structured in society so that not only do you have the production of these constructs of race and gender, but the way that they get laid on to and into uh, societal relationships has this reproductive kinds of pieces so that they have this multi-iterative a uh, way of creating difference and making difference have meaning in society. So if you need a refresher on this in terms of race and gender, I've given you a couple resources. The, that YouTube link that you see there uh, will help you uh, plug into a conversation that you probably had in either your ethnic studies or gender studies course. If you're trying to find it, again, this is a static link, so you can't quite click it and it'll open up for you. But you can go to YouTube and type in the title that's uh, listed below and that will take you to that link. And really what you need to see is probably the first 25 minutes of that and that'll refresh your memory. So that idea of race and gender as socially constructors are going to be the key of what we are going to uh, look at. So as we think about race and gender, we need to understand the way that they're institutionalized because what we are interested in this course is understanding the institutionalization of race and gender and specifically the idea of not just race and gender but the multiple social constructs of race, gender, sexuality, uh, ability. All of these undergo different kinds of institutionalization. 
And that definition that you have there is a way of understanding the way that they get structured into society. And that structuring, particularly through the way that laws, rituals, as well as practices, they have this reoccurring kind of piece in which they get fortified. That iterative piece is really important because that iterative piece of how they get fortified and passed on from individual to, from individual, to individual as well as one practitioner to a practitioner becomes important because that's the reproduction piece. So that link and that coupling between production and reproduction becomes very important. All of this has a beginning point, right? And the beginning point is understanding how race and gender get produced through cultural apparatuses and then how they get caught up or entangled in these social reproduction facets that become important for us to know. So this institutionalization becomes important in understanding how difference finds its way into our lives. So as we move through this, we want to make sure that we understand how difference becomes produced through these cultural apparatuses and then how they get taken up further and structured in the patterning of social life through different kinds of institutions. Let's begin first of all with the production piece. Just to clarify, when we talk about production, we're talking about discursive production here. It could Discursive production is a way of understanding different cultural apparatuses, the novels, uh, movies, other kinds of texts, as well as different kinds of shared belief systems, get in, come into play to construct these elements that we're calling race and gender. These pieces also have the structuring and get caught up into societal patternings. So that when we think about the way that the employment market or possibly the way that residential patterning in the United States works, these pieces find a way to get substantiated in these stuff. So let me talk about difference as it becomes produced and reproduced. So the production piece has to do with the discursive production element. And the realm of discourse is important because you and I are saturated in different apparatuses that give us different discourses they produce these racial and gendered meanings. And the discursive piece has to do with popular culture. Culture as uh, different elements that we consume, like novels, like movies, like other kinds of texts, provide us with a way of thinking about and conceptualizing different elements that are part of our world. And race and gender are two of those key elements, as well as the body, as it pertains to ability, uh, sexual orientation are caught up in these different discursive productions. So if you think about if you took a gender course, the Jane Austen readings that you probably had were a way of actually giving you a different way of thinking about woman and womanhood and what a woman is able to do and think and be and that is the realm of discursive production. That becomes significant for us because our belief structures are very much informed by these discourses that uh, circulate as part of our, our part of our world. The social reproduction piece has to do with those durable patternings in society. That's kind of the material world is what we think about. So when we think about the labor market, when we think about the wage structure, when we think about residential patterning in the United States, all of that has to do with the structuring of society to create these durable structurings. And these patternings are those structures. So the discursive production piece and the social reproduction piece work hand in hand. You have belief structures that are informed by these discursive production elements. And the social reproduction piece plugs us in, in terms of practice and action, into creating and recreating what we understand as society. So now let's look at these social mechanisms of racism as well as gender inequality. I don't want to focus on racism as a way of talking about this, uh, but I'll also connect to gender inequality in the way that sexism is structured in society. And what now that we've located the way of thinking about discursive production as well as uh, social reproduction, 
uh, let's talk about racism. Well, what exactly is racism if we have this discursive production process or element as well as the social reproduction element? We can understand racism as the social structuring of difference, of differentiation as well as discrimination based on the construct of race. We can also understand sexism along the same axis, which is sexism is just re a replacement of race and putting in the construct gender. So now that we have a way of understanding social reproduction as well as discursive production, let's now think about what are the social mechanisms of racism as well as uh, sexism. And what I want to plug in here is just a general definition of racism. Now, what's important to understand that there are different competing versions of racism. Some of them are much more individual uh, focused, others are much more collective, and others are even much more macro, which are much more systemic. And what we're going to do is kind of suture all of these together to help us think about racism. So racism is essentially one way of thinking about this is the social structuring of difference, differentiation and discrimination based on the construct of race. And the idea of it being systemic as well as individual and collective as well as structural gives us a way of understanding this construct. Sexism, on the other hand, is just the differentiation based on sexual difference and the way that sex and gender identity is constructed. So this particular piece becomes important for us of just understanding the way that what we're talking about here is this process of differentiation at both an individual level, but also understanding the way that it's a system-wide way of thinking about uh, the way that difference is produced. And when we think about systemic uh, facets of this, what we are trying to put in place is the way that cultural meanings uh, instantiate or put into place a way of thinking about race and racial meanings but also the way that those get patterned and structured in society relationships. So racism as well as sexism have a similar set of machinery, but they work from different kinds of constructs. And let's go to thinking about how does this pr production and reproduction function. Well, what's important is there's two facets to this. One, there's both a subtle as well as overt way of thinking about the way that racism and sexism, sexism operate. It, the subtle manifestations of racism are through that literary and popular cultural, or what we might call these kind of cultural institutions. We are all tuned in or plugged in to one kind of cultural apparatus or another. And those pieces are constantly inscribing as part of our imagination as well as our belief structure different meanings about race, about blackness, about whiteness. Um, what we find is what you probably call from your ethnic studies courses as well as gender studies courses is the way that these uh, different instantiations, these uh, meanings of race and gender, they are very, very tacit so that they work upon us so that we don't even realize the way that they are coming to shape our imagination and how we think and believe what constructs are. And so that subtle piece is very important because they also work to structure the more overt different elements. And those are those structural relationships. And if you recall, those structural relationships are those durable material patternings in society. And the political as well as state society, societal dimensions all work from these particular meanings we find uh, that different apparatuses are constantly trying to mobilize a particular concept of race or gender as a way of thinking about how to create policy as well as mandates and govern how we engage in these different pieces. So a current discussion that uh, is ta taking place presently is the way that gender is being defined. So the conversations about bathroom usage for transgender individuals, we have a political apparatus that is working from a particular set of constructs about gender, gender identity, and trying to create a governance structure or a set of rules, as well as practices and rituals,
that correspond to the particular set of rules where individuals are no longer adhering to those particular rules. These are individuals who are essentially those transgressors, and we'll talk about transgressors in a bit because it's become important to understand. But what becomes important in terms of thinking about these dimensions of uh, production and reproduction is that they create privilege systems. And these privilege systems are very, very important because in society we have different kinds of privilege systems that you and I experience, but sometimes they are so tacit uh, at some times that they are like water to a fish. Um, we don't realize how they function. At other times, they're very, very uh, pointed and do a great deal of material, emotional, psychological damage to us. So if we think about the way that male privilege functions in society, male privilege is, finds its way into everyday labor market dimensions. They find themselves into remuneration uh, structures that are part of society as well as uh, when we think about white privilege. White privilege is another piece of one of those dimensions. And white privilege is also one of those ideas of how systems of whiteness work to structure a particular way of privilege systems or super an alleged superiority system that is trying to advance one group over another. So these privilege systems are very important because they are the way that they are experienced by individuals. They are experienced by one group in terms of the way that they are appointed. And for other groups, they are so tacit they aren't able to see it. So another piece that we want to hit at is that when we think about race and gender, and particularly that racism and sexism, they many times they never happen alone. They happen entwined with each other. There's this intersectionality, and what that intersectionality is pointing to is the way that race and gender are part of a couplet. They essentially work together to create a uh, entwined set of dynamics. So one of the tasks that you're going to be doing is you'll be taking a look at different kinds of uh, different kinds of data, and your analysis is going to be unearthing how race and gender work together. So let's move in some tests to be able to understand the social reproduction facets. You have two tasks that are going to come up. And then what you're going to do is you're going to go online and identify some sources that help you put into play and some sense of understanding, the understandings of how gender and race uh, materialize in the social domain. And Take a look at the directions here. You might want to pause this and kind of take a piece once I'm done talking. But you're going to print out two sources, and you're going to bring these to class. But prior to coming to class, you're going to do some analysis. And I've given you some parameters on what you're going to do with these two sources. And you're going to be creating what we call analysis statements. And these are essentially you doing some analysis and trying to come with some strong statements that indicate what the data is suggesting. So you are going to do this for task one and task two. I've given you some, some uh, sense of how to go about looking at these. So the first one is going to be looking at wage gaps. And then the second piece is going to prompt you to take a look at employment structure. So take a look at these two pieces. And then when you meet in your class and or discussion groups, Pick up these discussions and uh, be prepared to talk about what the social pattern needs are. Finally, the last task is looking at residential segregation. This is another example of the structural domain that I'd like you to pick up. And your task is to go to the following website and identify three cities of your choice within large metropolitan regions 
and do an analysis along the parameters that I've set forth here. And what you want to do is engage in this analysis, but also step back to take a look at the three different points of analysis that you've done in terms of, of uh, the three tasks that you've, I've set in front of you and determine what kinds of privileges are established through these different structural relationships. So let's begin to locate individuals within this uh, matrix of discourses as well as structures because we have to understand how all of this is held together, right? Because you have these discourses which are one realm, but then you also have the social structures which are another. And they get integrated somehow. So how do they become integrated? And this is where individuals become very important. And importantly, what's, what we need to understand is the way that different discourses materialize in society. And these discourses uh, materialize as ideologies as they get located in different structures, different mechanisms, and individuals become carriers and investors in these different kinds of, of social frameworks. So these social frameworks, they mask a lot of these different dimensions of how uh, racism as well as sexism are produced. So many times the discourse ideology of meritocracy. Meritocracy, if you recall, is that idea that individuals rise by their own merit. The idea that the way that preferential systems functions has no inclination of race, class, gender, or sex. And fundamentally, it's by your own merits that you are chosen and rise in the social system. Another piece that uh, is mass the way that privileges function is the ideology slash discourse of markets. And that idea of markets is the idea that you have a different choice system in play and that these choice systems is predicated on a, an individual's ability to pay or what a market will support. And these two ideologies are important because they essentially work to mask the underworkings of the way that race, gender, different labor distribution across society is actually socially constructed. And so that becomes important to understand of how individuals are part of this, part of this puzzle. So belief structures are part of this piece, right? Um, the way that belief structures of individuals come to play is they adopt and integrate these different ideologies into their belief structures and these are the way they begin to view the world. So individuals may be living within a system of privilege, be it gender privilege, uh, be it racial privilege, but these discourses like meritocracy as well as the market selection process has a way of taking those off the hook taking these privileges out of the system. And so belief systems, uh, depending on the networks that we're situated in, will uh, essentially uh, support these different discursive framings of how we as individuals are put into place in the social structure. So that's the glue. That is the glue of how individuals are, are located in this. You have professional ideologies about uh, what we do as teachers, say, that works to structure how we are located in and how we invest in these different ideologies. Some individuals are much more transgressive about these and are able to kind of penetrate the different ideologies and ask questions about them. Uh, so that becomes important. Now, the idea of transgressors are these individuals who are able or who are able to uh, engage and disrupt these different ideologies. And we've seen different transgressors in history. If we think about the abolitionist movement, you have individuals like Harriet Tubman as well as John Brown who were able to interrupt the way that we as a society were thinking about blackness and about freedom. And these individuals inserted a way of interrupting that particular system. 
you also have other transgressors that uh, also have interrupted the uh, way that we think about constructs like sexuality. Annie Prox is the author of Brokeback Mountain. She's the individual who wrote the novel. And what's important is she gives us a way of thinking about the genres of the Western, cowboy Western, as well as the love story genres, and flips them on their head in some respects and tweaks them in a way that uh, we as consumers of these are beginning to think about these genres in a different way. So these represent the way that transgressors come to rework the way that these social meanings are put into play. They are a way for uh, us to rethink a lot of the ideologies that uh, we have consumed and move into a different iteration, a hybridization, say, of some of these constructs. Let's now link the macro and micro and specifically begin to index or put into play the school structures that come and interplay with the larger societal structures. The readings that you have for this module are essentially putting into conversation the elementary level as well as the secondary level. Uh, facets in how school structures work in structuring and inequality, and importantly, how school structures might be done differently as a way to uh, open up some possibilities. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through some of the key pieces here because the readings are actually doing a great deal of work for you of putting into conversation and identifying some of these pieces. But I'm just going to highlight some of the pieces that you need to identify in your readings. Uh, first of all, within the elementary piece, uh, the elementary level, one of the facets that becomes important to understanding is the way that academic tracking uh, has come to structure in, in terms of placing these micro and macro kinds of facets into play. Structures, tracking structures in terms of ability grouping is one of those pieces that we see has a way of reproducing uh, the social structure of inequality. And what's importantly, the way that we come to understand the social isolation that exists in society that you've identified in task one, task two, and task three equally are uh, resemble or mirrored in the academic tracking. And that becomes important to understand at the elementary level. And tracking has a way of manifesting itself equally in the secondary level, and we'll come back to that piece in just a second. If we also think about special education referral systems and the way that the referral process takes place, there's a conversation about disproportionality. And there's a disproportion in the number of males as well as students of color in special education. And the readings are going to identify for you the way that that too is a structural mechanism in schools. And this is where the belief structures partly of teachers truly have uh, a way of impacting this way of referral system, uh, the way this referral system manifests itself to create and over-identify individuals. This is not to negate that some students have, have definite disabilities that have to be attended to, but the research points to the way that there's a disproportional uh, identification of students on the basis of language ability, if they're English language learners, as well as dependent on other markers that are indicators of social class as opposed to a disability. The last piece that we're going discipline pattern. In the way that discipline is executed and exercised in elementary schools equally has a way of uh, adhering to a race and class facet. So this piece is something you want to identify in your readings as well, to be able to determine how does this have a social patterning. So again, all of these pieces connect with this macro societal piece that we put in place in the first part, first part of this module. Connect those pieces as you begin to uh, think through these different facets. Let's go to the micro pieces and macro dimensions of the secondary level. These two are very important. The way that student course taking patterns are also reflective of a race in class partition 
and divide in high schools. AP and IB uh, courses is one of those facets that we've come to understand as being stratified by race and social class. So we can see how this particular function is also reflective of the larger social structural relationships that we see in society. And why are these pieces important? The other piece that becomes important in terms of the secondary rate, which is connected to the discipline pattern that we identified in the elementary level, is the suspension rate dispar disproportional uh, facets. And if you take a look at this data, particularly I'd like you to ident go to a website and plug in this plug in this HTTP address and take a look at page two and take a look at the suspension rates uh, for different students. Take, identify what patterns you see in these suspension rates. How do they adhere to a larger pattern of race and class and gender based on what you're able to see? And what you will be able to notice more importantly is the idea of race and gender are going to be the key uh, dimensions that uh, become noticeable. So let's summarize what we have garnered from this conversation. First of all, you should have been able to connect the way that the macro structural relations are connected to micro uh, facets in creating these isms. Specifically, we've talked about the way that uh, discursive realms connect with structural realms. And hopefully you have a sense of understanding of how the, these two connect. And specifically, what is a discursive, what is the discursive realm and what constitutes the um, social structural realm? Equally, the second piece that we talked about was the way that individuals as well as ideologies become the social glue for the structuring of these isms. And more importantly, social inequality. Individuals invest in these different frameworks. These social frameworks about race, about gender, about ability needs individuals to be carriers as well as supporters of these particular social structural dimensions. So it becomes important as educators of thinking about how we are plugged in to different kinds of ideologies and how we might intervene. Third, hopefully you've been able to determine, particularly after engaging in the three tasks and looking at the readings that you have, the way that schools and society are entangled. And part of our task as teachers is trying to create different kinds of relationships. So possibilities, and this is where the fourth piece comes into play, possibilities have to be transgressive. We have to find interjections for ourselves as educators to be able to recreate the system create the different structural relationships that students experience. So that concludes Module 3.